also known as a scientist, and rather pretty. Morning, everyone. Okay, um, so should we get started here? Um, we're gonna try something a little bit different this morning. Um, I'm gonna start off with the share and then we'll get into the verse. Um, so my share will be based on the theme, which is don't tell me what you believe, um, show me how you behave. And um, I thought I'd start off <laughs> this morning with a, a, a personal story. Um, that happened a couple weeks ago. Um, my husband and I were, we have these like beautiful um, boxes, plant boxes, like right outside of our house. And I love them. <laughs> I love putting flowers in them every year and they just like bring me so much happiness. Well, one of the boxes like kind of broke a little bit and you can still put plants in it, but it's like hit or miss whether or not the plants will actually stay and grow because it's kind of decrepit. So I asked him this year, I'm like, can you fix that box? So he's like, yeah, I can fix a box. I'm like, okay, great. So we go out uh, to plant and to fix, and he's trying to fix the box and I'm planting in the other planters. And he's like running. I see him like run away from the box. I'm like, what's going on? What, what's, is, is everything okay with the box? He's like, there's like bees. There's like a big bumblebee nest, like right under the box. And they're like all coming out. I'm like, <laughs> being the bulldog that I am, I'm like, just fix it anyway. Just get in there, fix the box. Don't worry about the bees. He's like, oh, I really don't know. So it, it's, he's working on this for like 20 minutes, running away, running back, running back. I'm like, can we just like do something about the bees? Like, I don't know. Like, is there some kind of spray we can get? Or like, I really want this box and I don't want these bees to inhibit me from being able to plant my plants. And he's like, Rachel, I think we're just, we don't want to kill the bees because the bees are so good and this is their home. I'm like, well, can we move their home? Well, we, this is their home. This is where they want to be. I'm like, goodness gracious, this is going to look ridiculous. I can't put plants in this box because these bees own it. He's like, I think you might just have to let go of this box this year. I'm like, no way am I letting go of this box. <laughs> so, so I get all my plants. I run over to the bees. I'm like, you know what, bees, you scoot over. I'm going to put my plants in here anyway. So I plant my plants and um, and I'm like, I was actually just watering them yesterday and all the bees came out as I'm watering them and, I'm, and then I'm doing what my husband's doing. And, I'm, and um, anyway, moral of the story is like, I was ready to kill the bees, I'll be honest with you, because I wanted this box so well. I felt like I owned this box. This was my box. And my husband reminded me, like, this is their home. This is we we can't just we can't just get rid of these bees. This is this is their home. And um and you know, my husband's not a devotee, a practicing devotee. He's a devotee at heart, but he's he practices Catholicism, so he's he's not um on the bhakti path. And um, I sometimes when devotees ask me like, oh, so you met your husband before you were practicing? I was like, nope, <laughs> I met my husband when I was a devotee. Um, because what was important to me at that time was, um, and, and still is more than anything, is um, the essence of these teachings and not so much, you know, dressing up in, in the beautiful outfits that we dress up in or, you know, carrying a Joppa bag everywhere or whatever our practices are, it's not so much that to me, it was like I saw his heart um, when I met him. And that's what mattered a lot to me. And um, there's this verse, it's to me, it's kind of like, it's one of like our golden, what would they call that? The golden rule. It's I think of it as like kind of the golden rule in, in Bhakti, if it's not Vedasar, Chaitanya Shri. Sharon Prabhu can correct me later, but it's um it reads, one should chant the holy name of the Lord in a humble state of mind, thinking oneself lower than the straw in the street. One should be more tolerant than a tree, devoid of all sense of false prestige, and should be ready to offer all respect to others. In such a state of mind, one can chant the holy name of the Lord constantly. And I remember when I met my husband, I thought, this man imbibes all of those things. And I struggle with them. I struggle with them and I'm meditating a couple hours a day and, and he just like naturally imbibes them. So um, 
that that was uh, my experience with that. Now, I will say, fast forward into marriage a few years, and you notice no one's perfect, and and you know we're not practicing the path of perfection here. We're practicing the path of transformation. So now it's like the best you could do is is show up and be be honest with yourself about the things that your shortcomings and be honest with your partner about your shortcomings and work together to try to, um, to try to grow and transform together, recognizing that, you know, no one's perfect, but, um, just to share a little bit of, 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 um, this, this theme I really liked because I, it's such a high value of, of mine. Um, and, that's that's my take on the theme. Now, um, if we want to get into the verse, and Chaitanya Charon Prabhu and Veda Sar Prabhu can give us the um, synopsis on the, the take uh, from the Bhagavad Gita, that would be wonderful. You would like this prayer of invocation. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. This is a verse from the 12th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, verse number 15. Yasman no dvijate loko, lokan no dvijate chaya, arsha marsha bhayo dvegai, mukto ya sacha me priya. Translation. You're on mute, so you have to unmute yourself. Oh, wow. Thank you, Veda. He by whom no one is put into difficulty and who is not disturbed by anyone, who is equipoised in happiness and distress, fear and anxiety, is very dear to me. Thank you. Thank you, Brother David, for sharing that experience. It's very apt for what you're saying over here. And uh, if we talk about this verse, if we consider that there is the, we are, see I'm here, somebody else is here. Now, above us, there is the divinity the all-pervading divinity that is above. So often people think of spirituality as the way they relate with the divine. This is what they think of as spirituality. And it is definitely. So this involves the spiritual practices like you mentioned. It could be it could be chanting mantra, it could be prayers, it could be certain practices. All those are there. And that is what is primarily considered as spirituality. And that is but in this particular section, what the Gita is telling us is our spirituality is seen by how we relate with others also. So the test of our spirituality is, is also seen in our relationship. So in general, the nature of life is that we somehow or the other, sometimes intentionally, many times unintentionally, we disturb others. So we disturb others and then we are disturbed by others. So the test of our spirituality, the test of one test of our spirituality, our devotion is that this we can minimize. Now, we cannot avoid disturbances to some extent because disturbances are just natural to life. So we could say one way is that 
if this life is like ups and downs, they're there. So now those ups and downs, one of the characteristics of a steady person, the Bhagavad Gita says, a spiritual person is that the outer ups and downs, the the effect on them, effect of them internally is much lesser. So there will be some effect, but much lesser. So now this same principle we can apply to our relationship. That if say somebody else, so this is the other person, now they act in disturbing ways. But so their actions are disturb disturbing actions are there. But even though the actions are there, we stay calm. So we are not disturbed by those actions. And we're not disturbed because we have inner, inner spiritual strength to tolerate their actions, to moderate our responses. And then conversely, suppose, now we can just change this image slightly, suppose we are internally disturbed. So, so this is our internal. But even when we are internally disturbed, when we act our external, because of our spirituality, we are able to relatively stay calm. And thus, when our actions reach the other person, the other person is not disturbed by our actions. So both, there's no, we don't, we are not disturbed by others and then we don't disturb others. So this is the overall meaning of this word in a pictorially depicted way. Any comments? Yes, sir, Prabhu. I think uh, it, this is a very uh, a verse that is very personal to me because I see a disturbance as, as something that is uh, primarily felt in the mind. And so all these emotions of disturbances from, say, others or my own mind or nature, all this is felt in my mind. So whenever those disturbances come, I realize I have to distance myself from the mind. When I'm able to distance myself from the mind, then it enables me not to be disturbed by the disturbances that are provided to me by different external forces. So the thing that works for me always is to realize that I'm not the mind whenever there is any disturbances. Where is this sensation being felt in my life? When I'm disturbed, do I feel it in the gut? Do I feel it on my back? Do I feel it on my shoulders? So this disturbance is, I'm able to pinpoint it it's primarily focused on the mind. So I realize that it has its own way of coping and dealing with it, but it has nothing directly to do with me. So I separate myself from the mind. And then I always keep in mind the more I'm centered in my heart, and which means going deeper into myself, then it's easier for me to not be affected by this. I don't remember where I read this or who I have heard it from, but in the ocean, there's a lot of waves and these waves are continuous. It's just part of life. Disturbances are just what it is. It's not something that you can just, you know, erase all disturbances in your life. It's just, if we have a material body, if we exist in this world, we are gonna be disturbed just like the waves in the ocean. But then there's these fishes that actually are on the bottom of the ocean where they're not 
having to deal with the waves on the top of the ocean. So I look at life as a journey where the more we are able to go deeper into ourselves, then we are not subjected to these major waves that come and try to throw us off. So this is what I was thinking whenever I think of this verse. And that is, of course, being in the heart is, is, is realizing that uh, there is that space of uh, divinity that is situated very close to you within the heart. So this is what I find personally, this verse, very applicable to me. I love that you went there, Vedasar Prabhu, about the connection with the, the separation between the body and the mind. Um, yesterday, I was talking to a family member who recently was through some health issues and as a result got on a um, steroid. And I've kind of been talking to her throughout this journey for her. And I talked to her a couple of days ago and I could tell she was just very full of anxiety. And, um, and I talked to her then yesterday and I said, how are you doing today? And I could tell she felt she was, she was lighter and her voice was better. And she was like, oh, you know, I feel so much better. I talked to my doctor yesterday and uh, my doctor said, I told her that I was having so much anxiety and I'm not used to having so much anxiety. And my doctor said that the steroid was causing me all the anxiety and it just made me feel so much better. It's almost like, and that's not really the point, but the, the point is that the distance that the doctor created between her mind, like the doctor told her, the anxiety is not you. The anxiety is the steroid, which in, in spiritual life, we go even, we go higher than that. You know, the, we're not the body, the mind, regardless of what external influence it's coming from. It's not us, but just the fact that, that um, she had been told that it wasn't her relieved her anxiety. And it's almost like, we have to have that realization to be able to even deal with it or we're so like tied to it, like attached to it as ours. And then we're just trying to defend it or say that it's not there or we're so like caught in our ego that we can't even see, we can't even zoom out enough to get like a bird's eye perspective because we're just too in it. So I just thought it was really interesting that just her, just her doctor telling her that it wasn't her relieved her like immediately. <laughs> mm, very nice. Yeah. So beautiful. Now we talk this point of distancing ourselves from our mind and uh, how it is a vital principle of spirituality. Uh, in this particular section, this distancing, this distancing from our mind. During the pandemic, we had physical distancing. Hmm. But now we also need mental distancing, whether there's pandemic or not. This can be done by two ways. One is by introspection. So what we're talking about, just we get the we get the insight, we remember the insight. And that distances us from our mind. But there is another way, and that is the focus of this verse, that is devotion. We could say, now sometimes devotion is thought of simply as emotion. Oh, that means that when I'm hearing some spiritual music, some, some music about the divine, then I feel very good. I go in a place which is associated with divine, sacred place, I feel good. So devotion is associated with emotion. However, devotion is also dedication. In one sense, emotion is, you could say, outside in. Emotion is what we feel. Hmm? But dedication is inside out. It is what we do. And when there is a sense of devotion in the form of dedication, the dedication manifests, you could, we could say, purposefulness. So that when there is a higher purpose in our interactions with others, 
then that also helps us decrease the disturbance. So when I'm interacting with others, if we are largely in the material conception of life, then the primary thought is when I see someone, what comes in my mind is what can this person do for me? What can I get from this person? This person is wealthy, maybe we'll go for a party together and this person will take the bill. This person good looking, maybe I can get some physical pleasure. So what can this person do for me? If this person is famous, then I can get a selfie with them and I can also get some likes on my social media. This is the material conception. But the, and when we have this conception that what can this person do for me? If this that person does not do that thing for us, then immediately the idea is, that, okay, why should I care for this person? What is the value of being with this person? And then naturally, if that person does something which is different from our expectation, then we get disturbed. But the spiritual conception is when we are interacting with others, it's the attitude of service. It is, what can I do for this person? So this person is also a part of the divine. And as an expression of my love for the divine, I want to serve, love, serve the divine and I want to serve all, serve everyone's relationship with the divine. So when we are looking at the other person, if we are thinking, what can I do for this person? Then if that person is disturbed, I try to calm them down. I may also be disturbed, but as a service, I'll try to restrain my disturbance and I'll try to uh, help that person decrease the disturbance. So this, the, the, the way devotion affects us is not so much uh, yeah, introspection is important, no doubt. But there's another way is through having that devotional purposefulness, a service attitude. So my problems might be there, but I would like to be of help with this person's problems. Like a doctor may have some personal problems in their family, but a doctor is treating a seriously sick patient. Then the doctor's focus is on, okay, how can I treat this person? And their own problems go back into the background. Of course, if sometimes the doctors may be disturbed and the doctors may nap at patients. Doctors may do that's a different thing. But if a dedicated doctor is there, then what can I do for this person? So even if, if I consider this to be my consciousness and there is this disturbance in my consciousness, but if there is the devotional purposefulness, the service attitude, then what will happen with time is this is the disturbance that is there as a part of my consciousness. This is the service attitude, the devotional purposefulness that is there. Then over time, if that service attitude is strong, then that service attitude will fill the consciousness mm -hmm. and then okay. the disturbance will become small. So is what you're saying is there's what you're saying overall is there's a couple ways to create this space in our mind. Yes. From from identification with the mind. And one is introspection and the other is devotion. And when yeah. you're talking about de devotion, you're talking about changing the dynamics of our relationships. So where we show up in a relationship looking for how can I be satisfied? What can I get out of this? To your, what you're suggesting is that we drop that mentality and we show up as how can I serve this person? Is that what you're saying? Yes, yes, perfect. Okay, now a couple of questions I have that come up with that. One is you can sh show up for a person or you can kind of show up in a relationship and say, what can I do for you? But, but you're still maybe even in serving them, you're looking for something out of, from it. Like you're looking for them to appreciate you or to like, at some point it's going to require introspection so that you can purify your own ego. Right. Cause yeah, I'm, I'm not saying that we don't have introspection. Of course, introspection is required. All that I was saying is that this, in this particular verse, 
that this is described to be a devotional virtue that indicates that this ability to decrease our being disturbed can come from our service attitude. That's the only point I'm saying. Like suppose there is a mother. The mother is afraid of the dark. Young mother. Say. And now she has a small child and suddenly the power goes off. The mother will be disturbed because the power has gone off. But she will be uh, she says, mommy, mommy, I'm scared. And the mother, because of her service attitude, because she wants to care for her child, instead of giving in to her fear and collapsing, she will say that, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it'll be all right. We'll find the light will come back. The power will come back. She will, she'll calm down. And that is how things will work. So, right. so, so, so even in that case, there's no doubt there has to be a certain level of uh, introspection. That, but the point is, the focus is not, in when the person is, is on the path of devotion, the focus need not be the introspection. The focus can be the service attitude by which the introspection happens automatically. Interesting. Okay. When I look at this, I, I look at it a little bit differently. I look at introspection as one of the most powerful stepping stones to leading to devotion, dedication, and of course, connected to purpose because introspection gives a person the time to reflect, to see all the angles that are possibly impacting this disturbance. You know, sometimes, you know, for example, a person can come home from work and something happened at work, they come home and something very small could irritate them and cause a tremendous amount of disturbance. And that little something could spark into something bigger. So this disturbances, I feel, is it, very uh, impactful when in dealing with it, when we are really understanding the situation, the disturbance that is being caused, where is it coming from? Is it me or is it the circumstance? Is it the situation? Is that, am I bringing this from somewhere else? So looking at the, the situation from various different angles gives us the, the ability to see things in proper perspective. And I think that leads to, to devotion and then to dedication with purpose. Because we realize that, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't need to be affected by this little argument that we just had in the kitchen because we have a higher purpose to live for. So I find that that, that introspection is very, very critical junction in, in, in coming to this conclusion because that is where our intelligence is at play, uh, discovering all possible causes for that disturbance because if we don't know the causation, how can we really, really develop that deep devotion. So I don't feel like it's two pronged approach, rather it's one leading to the other, possibly more introspection leading to devotion than devotion leading to introspection. But I think, of course, there almost seems uh, very interconnected. Your thoughts on that? Yeah. No, I was thinking more from the perspective of that there is a the path of jnana and there's the path of bhakti. So generally observing the mind and distancing oneself from the mind, I also find it a very important and empowering exercise, no doubt about it. I'm not devaluing it. The only point I'm making is that uh, <clears throat> in this particular section of the Gita, the significance of it being described as a devotional attribute is that this this can be a, something which enables us to practice our devotion better. And in that sense, we can use introspection to help us practice it better. And at our level, definitely, it's good to use introspection. At the same time, there is, there is a higher level of existence where we could say that for somebody who is deeply devoted 
this comes as a reflex action. They don't have to contemplate and analyze and distance themselves as a conscious action. Their purpose is so strong that and that the service attitude is so deep rooted within them that they don't need to. But yes, uh, they are integral to any contemplative person's, uh, any any spiritually evolved person's way of functioning. Yeah, I guess it, yeah, because I'm thinking like if you if you live in this material world and you start off with the spiritual conception of just how can I serve you? How can I serve you? Because of your conditioning, you may you may not be serving the right people, and it may end up bringing you lower. Like you may be mixing your material conception of life with the spiritual because you're not purified enough, right? And you may even lack the ability to discriminate between getting in healthy servitor relationships, and therefore you're going to bring your consciousness down I mean, what about that vulnerability yeah that's true service attitude is not a substitute for intelligence in fact one as per aspect of service attitude is to know where to serve how to serve effectively so yeah definitely intelligence is required and in many cases service attitude may be mistaken uh, it, it may well be that When we focus on the practice of uh, using our intelligence, then we know where to serve, how to serve, what to serve. So in devotion, there, are, there is definitely there's a mode of service that is important, but then the object of service is also important. If somebody is in an abusive relationship and they keep serving the other person, they might just end up becoming the enablers of the other person. So there is the mode of service in the sense that there's the attitude of service you can say the attitude of service that is important but it's also the object of service that is important and within the object of service it's important to recognize that while we would like to be of service to everyone at the same time it's important to recognize that uh, not everyone is uh, well motivated so we have to have a hierarchy in the objects of service, a framework, and it is the divine that is our primary object of service. And then in relationship with that, we have other objects of service also. So if a child wants to eat a hundred chocolates and the mother thinks, I want to serve my child, so I'll give the child hundred chocolates. No, that would be a dereliction of duty of the mother. So service attitude always has to be coupled with intelligence. In a, in a parent-child relationship, that is easy to understand. That this, this is not, that's not what a responsible parent should be doing. But in other relationships, sometimes we may have to we may have to have a little more conscious discernment that is required. Yeah, that, that makes sense to tie into what Veda Sarprabhu um, said about the stepping stone of introspection. Because I feel like if you're if you're pursuing a relationship and it's and it's with somebody who's going to um, exploit that mode of service it's likely that your motive is is maybe to change that person or to get something from that person that you haven't in the past like love or appreciation and if you can purify your motive then you probably won't be attracted to serving that person anymore and therefore, you can purify your service and also attract people to serve that bring your consciousness higher. That's nicely put. Agreed. I, I was thinking of this. I'm not sure that metaphor would work, but I was thinking more like uh, this train tracks, you know, so that there's always checks and balances that the intelligence and the heart are both running parallel, Bhagavad Vidhi and, uh, and uh, Pancharatrika Vidhi, that the intelligence is there. Maybe those two may not be the correct words, but the intelligence is the constant companion. So we, are, we have a 
a deep reason for doing what we do. And at the same time, make sure that that, that mode of service, the attitude of service is, is correct and is kept in check with the intelligence. And at the same time, if we get too caught up in the mood of service, then we can, we can sometimes go through a process of spiritual bypass or be susceptible to exploitation because we're not using our intelligence. So that can also, possibility of that can be there if there isn't a checks and balance to this. What is yeah. it? Yeah, I fully agree with that. No doubt about it. There is something though about being an instrument of service that in my experiments, experience in experimenting with these things um, brings you to a higher place than really anything else. I, I do this um, breath work, this pranayama meditation with this healer. And um, it's like Wim Hof. I don't know if you guys have done Wim Hof before, but during it, he he kind of runs through these like grateful meditations where we think of things that we're grateful for. And he throws out things like, oh, the sun, the moon. And I'm like, oh, he's and so on. And then I'm thinking, okay, my dog, my, but then when I start thinking of um, people that I can serve, like when I think of like of serving Chitana Sharan Prabhu, serving my husband, serving, it's like, I feel like a lightness, almost like I have goosebumps. It makes, it makes me so much happier than just like things that I have that I'm grateful for. And it was just something I noticed the other day in that breath work that I really connected to like, wow, those kinds of relationships, if you can find those really healthy relationships and be an instrument of service in them and really try to purify that intention, it really is a framework for like the ultimate happiness. I felt <laughs> that's my experience. Yeah, beautifully put, you know, we have as much a need to give as we need to get. In, in psychology, there is this uh, concept of the need to be needed. That when our existence matters to someone else, then that gives meaning to our existence. So, now service is, of course, in various modes, but the idea that we get that happiness comes only by getting things. No, no, if there's a relationship where only we are giving and not getting, then it can become unsatisfactory or exploitative. But the idea is we also have a need to give. And when we find uh, individuals in our life who we, we, we feel connected with, who feel inspired by, then that actually brings out, not only brings out more of the giving spirit, but also and makes that giving spirit uh, uh, more beneficial for us as well as for others. Otherwise, as you said, giving spirit can be exploited, but, but definitely that is also a vital human need. It's often neglected otherwise. So where is that space of being equipoised? Because in this Gita, we're seeing that, uh, that, that Krishna is saying that someone who is equipoised is very dear to me, equipoised in happiness and distress, <clears throat> fear and anxiety. So, yeah, that is definitely there. Now we can say, what is the source of being equipoised? My understanding is that source is internal. Hmm? That internally that person has spiritual stability. Like if we consider this is the ocean, the world is like an ocean and there are waves in it. Now, if I have a steady anchor to hold on to, then by holding on to that anchor, I can stay steady even if there are ups and downs, even if there are waves go up and down. But at the same time, my steadiness, my being equipoised amid the waves does not mean that I should be indifferent towards others who are being tossed by the waves. 
So being equipoise, it is not being hard hearted. It is, it is not absence of emotion. It is more being clear headed. Clear headed means there is, there is a concern for the other person. Oh, this person is in trouble. I want to help that person. If you become hard hearted, you just don't care for others. And that, so the being equipoised is, okay, I have this shelter and I would like to share the shelter with others. But if in helping others get an anchor, I let go of my own anchor, then I will again be tossed away by the ocean. So that clear headed, it, it is that this is the anchor which is helping me, this is the anchor which can help others. So we could say here, hard headed is, hard hearted is no emotion at all. Whereas clear headed means no control by emotion. Emotions are not the basis of our decision making. They are one part. If somebody is in trouble, we need actually need to feel concerned about them. If we don't feel concerned, then where is our humanity? Leave alone our spirituality. But in our concern for them, we cannot become sentimental. Okay, if there is a pandemic and a doctor wants to help a patient, but even helping the patient, the doctor forgets to put on their own mask and the doctor gets infected, then what is the use of helping in that way? That is counterproductive. Am I addressing your point? Yeah, I think we're coming back to the, the core issue of how to be equipoised. Yeah. There is is there... a... Go ahead, Lana. Uh, could there be another line in here about ignoring your emotions or in the name of like, I'm, I'm supposed to be tolerant? I feel like that's something that I do sometimes that I'm trying to stop doing, actually. It's like, oh, well, I'm just supposed to be tolerant. I'm just supposed to. So so I don't say anything or I just ignore. And then it just builds up and is worse almost. So. When you're equipoise, I guess it's not just something that you choose that you're going to be, right? It's it's like a practice. And it's, I guess, learning how to have those emotions and how to express them healthily and deal with them healthily so that you can get to that point of real clear-headedness and not, not like feigned or like forced, right? Yeah. In my understanding that... Uh... Ignore, ignoring could be one way of dealing with uh, some things. But ignoring cannot be the only way of dealing with something. One of my favorite methods, metaphors rather, for understanding the, uh, understanding the mind or understanding how to deal with the mind is to consider it like, say, a, the mind is like a phone screen. Now, on the phone, there might be 50 notifications that have come. Now, some notifications, I just ignore them. And if I ignore them over time, they just go away. But some notifications, they're not meant to be ignored. If my phone is telling me that your battery is about to be discharged, that's not a notification I'm meant to ignore. So ignoring can be for those notifications that are not important because Generally, if something is, we could say, whether it's a thought, an emotion, a craving, whatever it is, if, if it is casual and circumstantial, only comes in particular circumstances, circumstances and it is, it casual means it is not very strong, then ignore. This goes away. But if something is insistent and persistent, it comes very strongly, it comes repeatedly, then definitely it needs to be addressed, it needs to be processed. So, say for example, we say don't be agitated by others, don't agitate others. Now, everybody may have some idiosyncrasies, some behavioral, co behavioral quirks, which uh, may not sit well with us. But if they do it only occasionally, and then it just, it just it strikes us as strange, it doesn't really worry us too much, then we couldn't ignore, ignore it. But if somebody acts in a way that annoys us, irritates us, 
enrages us and that's a frequent way that they frequently do something like that then maybe we have to communicate we have to do it in a way that does not offend the other person that does not insult the other person but still that communication is required so that the underlying issue can be addressed otherwise we will end up uh, not being able to function so when you say don't one who is not disturbed by others how are they not disturbed that varies from person to person how do they come to that level of equanimity by which they will not won't be, not be disturbed am i making sense here yeah, yeah that helps so it's kind of like a a journey almost of like noticing your your triggers um being open to seeing the cause of them trying on your side to come closer to a place of equipoise recognizing that you may not be there yet and if you're in a really if this involves somebody else that you have a good relationship with communicating that in a non-violent way so that maybe they can help you and in that way trying to make progress together or if it's an independent thing just working on on these things so that you can get closer to a state of being equipoised. Another, uh, if you go up on the screen just a little bit, another part that I really, a little higher, yeah, right here. Uh, one, one of the point that I feel <clears throat> that works for me, I'm not sure if it'll work for anyone else, to be equipoised where we have, you know, hard-hearted and clear-headed. To be clear-headed, one needs to understand, have a bigger understanding of the universal phenomenon, to understand that there is a universal order that is, that is at play, and there is a universal control. There is a higher intelligence that is at play that is beyond my control, and thereby I you know, accept that there is something more uh, that is affecting uh, the changes around me that I don't have control over. And thereby, I'm able to somewhat accept whatever is happening, let it happen. And there must be some sort of a, a plan that I'm not familiar with, that I don't understand. And there's got to be some divine uh, intervention that's causing all of this to happen. And so therefore, there is a level of acceptance that causes or enables me to be equipoised. You know, things that I cannot control, I accept and I surrender that there is some higher uh, players in this game of life and it's just not me and my little world. So this actually is something that helps me uh, to remain clear-headed and equipoised in difficult situations. Oh, so that's not... a beautiful point. It's like we don't know best, even though we think we do a lot of times. Oftentimes, there's a bigger plan for us. Yeah. yeah. yeah otherwise, I'm controlled by my emotions. Otherwise, I'm like, it doesn't make sense. Like, what you know, what's going on? Who is making all these miserable situations for me? You know, you brought a very important point to round off the discussion. See, when we talk about, say, our own spirituality, how do we stay undisturbed um, in our relationship with others? One is, say, we could say our own spirituality that brings us a certain level of mindfulness, certain level of mental distance. Then, just because we are anchored, then the second could be that we see that through this person, I am doing service to the divine. So the second could be the service attitude. Hmm. That I, I want to be of service, so I won't, I won't aggravate the situation. But there's another aspect to it, which is what your focus is saying now, is that, that actually the divine is acting through this person also. That whatever is happening, there is some higher plan. There is something behind this. So okay, that person may be behaving in an unreasonable way right now. but it is through that person's actions, maybe I'm being 
I am meant to some, learn something. Maybe I, this is for my growth. So when we see this vision that this, this is not just this person's action. Yes, it is that person's action, but there is also some bigger plan. So then that also brings a certain level of acceptance. Acceptance when we see the higher plan. So if we see only that this person is acting in this way, and then I'm alone, all alone in a big bad world, and this person is a big bad guy, then I have to hit back at that person. But I understand, okay, this person may be behaving in a questionable way right now, but the world is moving purposefully, even through this person's actions. So how can I respond in a way that is conducive for my growth? That can be very helpful. So one way to look at this is that if this is the present and this is the future. So we look at the present and plan the future. This is the human plan. Human vision is the human plan. But quite often, the divine plan works differently. The divine sees the future and plans the present. So maybe right now, this person is just being so mean to me. This person is being so unreasonable, so harsh. I'm miserable right now. Why am I here in this place? But maybe there's a higher plan. By learning to deal with this person, I grow in my maturity. I, be, I learn how to deal with difficult people. And maybe in future that will serve me well. When I have to do something, something responsible, something substantial, which requires dealing with different kinds of people. So this is the divine plan. It looks at the future and plans the present. So that way also we can be helped in minimizing the disturbance that may be caused by others' behavior with us and our, our reactionary behavior with them. Wow, that's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Happy to your service. Should we try to summarize? Please. Yes. So... Uh, okay, so let me go back. In fact, in some ways, this diagram itself was a summary, but we are discussing today about how, uh, to, how this principle of don't disturb others, don't be disturbed by others. So the Gita is telling that the first point was, it was a test of our spirituality. That is not just our direct so-called spiritual practices, but also our, we could say, our interpersonal dealings. How we, That's why the theme was, don't just tell me what you believe, show me how you behave. That is what here is being valued. So this, well, this is important. This is much, much more important. Our spirituality is seen through how we deal with others. And the dealing with others means that we act in a way Let's say if the other person is disturbing, we stay calm. And even if we are disturbed, the way we behave is that the other person doesn't become disturbed by that. So not disturbed and not disturbing. And then we discussed three ways to go about doing this. Not disturbed by others, not disturbing to others. So one way was introspection that I am not my mind. The disturbance is coming in my mind, but I am distant from it. So I, this is the soul, this is the mind. So this might be, the disturbance might be there here, but this can be steady. So introspection to distance ourselves from the mind was one way. And the second way was, we discussed service attitude that devotional purposefulness, how can I, what can I do for this person? That can help us again in staying calm because focus is not, why is this person not doing this for me? But what can I do for this person? Last part we discussed was through a focus on a higher plan, on the divine plan. That, okay, 
this person is behaving unreasonably, but let me not get overworked by it. Let me accept that there's something higher happening which I don't understand. And let me wait and see how things work out. Okay. Any concluding comments?